All right, hello. Uh, welcome to Principles of Microeconomics. My name is Nick Huntington Klein. Uh, I assume that you are here because you are in my class. Uh, if not, uh, then may I interest you in my book. Uh, it's good. It tells you how to do all the stuff that we're going to talk about in this series of videos uh, that are going to mirror the lectures that I give in my class. So let's get started right away. So first of all, uh, this what this lecture is going to be about is just basically what is economics? Uh, what, what can we do with it? Why bother? Uh, and in addition to that, things like, you know, what are incentives and how can we use them in a way that's going to help us understand the world? Because really that is the point of economics as a field uh, is, you know, it's, it's a misunderstood field by people who are not in it. It's not about how to make business investments, really. Uh, it's not about uh, how to predict what GDP is going to be. Uh, what economics is about is about understanding the world, understanding how people operate. Uh, and it does that through a particular lens. And if I had to give a definition for economics, I'd say that it's largely about how we respond to incentives and trade-offs uh, and understanding how we make choices. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand the world, uh, specifically the world of people. And there are lots of different ways to do that. You know, if you ask an anthropologist how to understand the way that people operate, they'll tell you to look at something like culture. How does culture operate? If you ask a sociologist, they'll tell you to look at society. Uh, if you ask a geographer, they'll tell you to look at how the layout of a, layout of a land is. And if you ask an economist, they will tell you to look at incentives. Uh, the idea that people respond to incentives and that we can understand our behavior on the basis of the choices that we make. So let's think about what that means. So first of all, uh, how do we make choices? And, and what are the incentives that go into making a particular choice? So first of all, what's an incentive? An incentive is something that we get in exchange for doing some particular action, right? It's the consequence of taking that particular action. Uh, so, you know, very basic example, let's say that you are given the option to mow your neighbor's lawn in exchange for $10. All right, so that's a pretty basic incentive. Uh, you know what the options are available to you. You can either mow your neighbor's lawn or you could not. And you know what the incentives are. Uh, if you mow their lawn, you get 10 bucks. And if you don't mow their lawn, then you don't get 10 bucks. And so in that case, the $10 that is offered to you is the incentive. Now, in that case, the incentive that we're talking about is in the form of money, but that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, economists, again, misunderstood, get a rap of only thinking that everything resolves around money, that money is the only thing that matters. That's actually not true. That not, that's not how economists really operate. Well, we're going to talk about money a lot in this class because, you know, it's a convenient example. Uh, but really, anything could be, be the incentive. It doesn't have to be money or $10. It could be that your neighbor is offering to give you a hug, a very nice hug in exchange for your mowing their lawn uh, or anything else. It could be that they'll uh, give you a recommendation for a job or it could be that they'll, you know, paint your house. Anything that it could be. As long as you know that you have a choice to make and that there are incentives that are tied to the different options that you have, you have a choice, you have the incentives, and economics is going to help us understand how those choices are made. So another example is that homework. Okay, well, in this class, assuming that you are in my class, uh, there is homework that is going to be due next week. And it's your decision of whether or not you are going to do that homework. Right? And you can just say, well, if I have to do the homework, I'm in class, and I'm, you're the professor, and you say that I have to do it, and you do. Uh, but that's not really it. You know, I, I can't really force you to do it. It's your choice of whether you're going to do it or not. Uh, and so, well, what are the incentives? Okay, well, if you do the homework, you're going to get a couple points that will make it easier to get a good grade in this class, which will in turn make it easier to pass this class, which will in turn make it easier to get a degree, uh, which you probably value to some amount. Uh, and also, you'll probably become a tiny bit smarter, right? You'll learn some things that you wouldn't otherwise know if you didn't do the homework. But you don't have to do it, right? What are the, what are the incentives to not do the homework? Well, you'll get the time back that you would have spent doing it, right? It's going to take you a little bit of time to do the homework. And if you don't do that homework, then you could do something else with that time. You could go watch some Netflix. Uh, you could just hang out. You could take a nap. Uh, but instead, you're going to do that homework, right? Uh, and so, you know, we have a choice and we have some incentives. Uh, you're either going to get the points and get, get a little bit smarter or you're going to have that extra time. And well, what's the cost of doing the homework? Well, it's giving up whatever you would have done with that extra time that you had. And so we can work with that, right? We have a trade-off for you. We don't just have incentives, we have a trade-off. You can't both do the homework and not do the homework. That is literally impossible. So you have to choose one or the other. 
Uh, there's a scarcity here. You only have so much time in the world, so you can't both watch Netflix and do the homework. You have to choose one or the other. Uh, and this leads us to an interesting thing that we can start off thinking about incentives with, which is that, well, what are the costs of doing something? You know, it's, it's really giving up what you could have had instead. So the cost of doing the homework is not, we're not going to think about it in terms of time. We're going to think about it in terms of what you could have done with that time otherwise. We're not going to say this costs you 10 minutes. We're going to say, well, it costs you whatever you would have done with that extra 10 minutes, right? That is lost to you now. That's the trade-off that you're making. So we have this basic choice, right? How do you make this choice, right? How do you choose? And answering that question is the basics of what economics is all about. And when we really understand how to answer that question, we're going to have a pretty good idea of how economics operates as a whole. And that's going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on your personal preferences. Right? Some people really like Netflix, and some people don't have that much else to do with their time. Uh, some people really hate doing homework, and some people don't mind so much. And so the decision, the trade-off, the incentives are going to be weighed differently by different people. Right? It's not just that everybody's the exact same. You know, you have to think about uh, how you process information. You need to think about how you consider the opinions of others. And also, importantly, right, in the whole process of understanding how we're making these decisions, we need to keep in mind, right, we don't just care about how people make decisions. We care about how those decisions relate to these bigger things that we care about, things like markets, things like policy. Right? All this thinking about how you're going to choose whether to do your homework or not, well, step back a minute. How did I decide what the incentives were to make you do your homework? Right? It's in my interest to get you to do it. Uh, and so as a policy maker in that regard, well, I have to choose what the incentives are that are going to make you do it. And I'm going to use incentives as a way to try to get you to do it. And that's going to go for policy uh, set by professors. That's going to go for policy set by governments. It's going to go for policy set by companies. Right? A lot of people in economics classes uh, are business majors and they're going to end up working in some sort of management position. And you're going to have to think, well, how do I think, how do I make policy company policy? How do I decide on our HR policy, our hiring policy? Or uh, how do I decide how to price our goods? Well, all those have to go back to incentives, right? You could be a sociologist and think about things in terms of society, or you could be an economist and you can think about things in terms of incentives and how you can modify behavior by setting incentives properly. Just a little bit harder to do than it, than it sounds like. So what we're going to do in this course over the entire uh, set, uh, course of things, we're going to think about how to, make how to deal with trade-offs and make choices, both in terms of how we should make choices and how people do make choices. Uh, we're going to talk about how those choices sort of aggregate and ball up and you end up with a big market uh, that does some interesting things, right? We think about markets. That's something that economists like to talk a lot about. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, those incentives come together and uh, inform how we might think about government policy or company policy and how it's designed. And we're also going to think about how we can just reason about the world, right? We are observers of the world around us and we want to understand what's going on. Um, hopefully you are curious enough to have looked around you and wondered what the heck was going on. Uh, and econ econ economic economics is going to be one way that's going to help you explain uh, some of those questions. So, uh, with that in mind, um, Let's, let's take one problem uh, that we can think about, and let's see what we can do with it in terms of incentives. So we have a problem, we're going to try to understand the world, and we're going to try to set some policy using incentives as our, our approach, as an economist would do, and see what we can do about it. And so that example we're going to start with is pollution. Okay? So we have a problem. Uh, we have, our activities put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. And whatever you happen to think about what the effects of that carbon will be, at the very least it will make the air less fun to breathe, which is going to be a bad thing. Okay? Uh, and we don't like it for a number of reasons. Uh, but importantly, and this is a thing that people tend to forget sometimes, is that this is a choice. Right? It's a choice that we're making to pollute. Right? Somebody decided that they were going to pursue some activity, like running a, a factory in a particular way, uh, burning a fire in a particular place, that added that carbon to the atmosphere. Right? It didn't just happen magically, somebody chose. And whenever you have a choice, that's when economics is going to have something to say about it. Okay, so let's think about what economics has to say about this particular choice. Well, let's think about what the trade-off is here. Right? we got to think about what the trade-off is, think about the choice, Think about the incentives, and that's going to lead us to some sort of interesting result. So 
What is the choice? Well, we have two options here. Let's say you're a factory runner and you're trying to decide how to design your factory. You could maybe get some scrubbers for your chimney that's going to reduce your carbon output. Uh, and you have two options. You can either build your factory in a way that's going to pollute more, or you can build your factory in a way that's going to pollute less. All right. Simple option. So what are, the, what are the incentives that are associated with these two options? Well, if you pollute more, uh, you might be able to make things more cheaply. Right? Those scrubbers are expensive. And if you don't buy them, you can sell your stuff more cheaply. And uh, that's probably going to make more money for you, and it's also going to be nice for the consumer. Uh, yeah, that's going to end up with more stuff being made overall. When stuff is cheaper, you can make more of it, uh, which is, means that there's going to be a higher standard of living. People are just going to have more stuff, right? Uh, well, that's, that's the incentive for polluting more. How about the incentive for polluting less? Well, if we pollute less, then that's going to be less damage to the environment, uh, which means that in the long run, when our descendants are you know, trying to make their own stuff, there's going to be more resources available for them. Uh, and uh, we might also end up with a, um, uh, a weaker economy, you know, because we're not producing as much stuff. But in the long run, in the future, maybe we'll have a stronger economy. So there's incentives, right? And so what would an economist say about this decision? Well, if, if let's say that we've decided for some reason that it would be a good idea to pollute less. Okay, that's our, that's our, that's our goal. So how are we going to do that? Well, an economist would say, change the incentives. People are polluting too much, change the incentives so that they don't want to pollute as much. Uh, so let's add an additional incentive to not pollute. If we make that side of the decision look a little bit better, people are going to be more likely to choose it, which is going to end up with less pollution overall. This is what we're going to call the incentive principle. What the incentive principle is, and this is going to blow your mind, uh, if you make the incentives for something better, more people are going to do it. Right? Real complex, right? Really, really out there kind of stuff. A lot of what we're going to cover today is going to be pretty common sense, I think you'll find. Uh, but believe me, we're going some, somewhere with this. Uh, so, a, a basic definition of the incentive principle is from the Frank and Bernanke textbook. Uh, a person, or a firm, or society, really any decision-making entity, uh, is going to be more likely to take an action if its benefit rises, and less likely to take it if the cost rises. In short, incentives matter. So, you want people to do something more? you add an incentive to do it. You want some people to do something less, like with our pollution example, you add an incentive to not do it. Or you take away one of the incentives to do it. Either way, it doesn't matter. So, how can we apply this incentive principle to our pollution example? Uh, well, we're going to do what British Columbia did in 2008, and we're going to introduce a carbon tax. Okay, what a carbon tax is, it basically sends somebody out to that factory, measures the amount of carbon that's coming out of the chimney, and says, okay, you've emitted this much carbon, we're going to tax you for all that carbon that you emitted. And the more carbon you emit, the more tax you're going to get. So let's think about how this changes the incentives, right? That's the goal, we're going to change the incentives. Uh, so now, uh, if you're polluting as much as you were before, you're going to be paying a tax to do so. And so by, by having that tax, we add an additional incentive to not pollute, Right? Because if you decide to pollute less than you did before, suddenly you're getting a tax break. Okay? Now that's going to add an incentive to the don't pollute side of the equation, of the trade-off, and that's going to lead people to choose to uh, pollute less rather than pollute more. So we should see that in British Columbia, and in fact, we do. Uh, so on this graph, what we can see is the carbon emissions in Canada uh, following over a 10-year period. Uh, what you can see when we start out is that uh, British Columbia and the rest of Canada are moving along at a similar rate. So I mean, you can see that Canada, the rest of Canada is already producing more. It's always producing more carbon emissions, but uh, they sort of go up and down together. Right? The difference between them stays pretty much the same. Then we get to 2008, we implement that carbon tax. The incentive principle says we've added, added an incentive to not pollute. That's going to get more people to not pollute. Now remember, this carbon tax was only in British Columbia, not the rest of Canada. And what do we see? Well, the rest of Canada continued on along on its merry way. Nothing particularly changed about its carbon output. British Columbia, on the other hand, saw a reduction. Right after that carbon tax went into effect, we saw that the carbon emissions in British Columbia started to drop, uh, which is exactly what the incentive principle said would happen which is one of the benefits of following, uh, of trying to manipulate behavior by manipulating incentives, right? Because people are going to follow incentives. That's what the incentive principle says. Now, there are other ways to build policy, of course. It's not just incentives. The world is not built entirely on incentives. You know, the sociologists have something to say. But in this class, in economics, we're going to be focusing on how we can explain things using incentives. And there is a lot of power in that. So. We're talking about incentives, we're talking about uh, trade-offs, 
And we'll, I'm gonna put in a little thing here. Uh, why do we think it's important to focus on trade-offs? We think it's important to focus on trade-offs because there always is a trade-off. There almost always is a choice to be made. Uh, and that's because everything is scarce. You can't have everything all at once, right? Just in the homework or Netflix example, you've only got so much time in the world. Uh, you know, or in a day, you've only got 24 hours, no matter what you do, you still only have 24 hours. And so there's always going to be a trade-off in terms of how you use your time. There's always going to be a trade-off in terms of how you use your budget. There's always going to be a trade-off in terms of picking this policy or that policy. We're always going to have to be trading off one thing for the other. And we're going to call that the scarcity principle. Things are scarce. We can't have everything all at once. And whenever that happens, whenever there is scarcity, which is the case for pretty much everything, we have to make a choice. We have to make a trade-off. And that is going to lead us to have to pay attention to those incentives. All right, we're doing a lot of uh, vocabulary here. We're gonna keep on trucking. We're gonna add in another principle. So we have the incentive principle that says that people follow incentives. We have the scarcity principle that says that there are trade-offs to be made for which people will follow incentives. And then we have this other one, which is not about how people do follow incentives, but it's about how you should make choices, right? This is a normative, by which I mean it tells you what to do rather than describes what you do. Uh, this is a normative principle. This is the cost-benefit principle. What the cost-benefit principle says is that an action should be taken only if the benefits for that action most exceed the costs relative to all your other options, right? So it's not just that the benefits exceed the costs, but that the benefits exceed the costs by more than they do for any other possible action. Again, real mind-blowing stuff. Pick the best option, right? Uh, but again, we are going to go somewhere a little bit more interesting with this. Uh, so let's think about what that means, cost-benefit principle. And what are costs and what are benefits? So in economics, we tend to think of costs and benefits as really being two sides of the same coin. It's really useless to think about one without thinking about the other one as well, right? Because what is a cost and what is a benefit? Well, you know, well, let's think about the pollution example. Uh, we talked about uh, the, one of the benefits for not polluting was avoiding a tax. Well, you could also say that getting taxed is a cost of polluting. Which one is it? Well, it's, it's either one. They're the same thing, right? A benefit for one thing is the cost of doing something else, right? Because if you do something else, if you do that thing that impl imposes the cost on you, well, and you do something else, you don't have to pay that cost anymore. So that's a benefit to you of not having to incur that cost. Uh, so costs and benefits are really just two sides of the same coin. Just benefits are positive and costs are negative. Uh, so let's take that basic idea, and that was a little bit muddled, but let's, let's put it in terms of an example. I think that will help. So let's go back to the mowing your lawn example. Should you mow your own lawn, or should you get someone else to do it? Right now you're in the, in the shoes of the person who's got the lawn to be mowed. So we need to think about the costs and benefits of each of these. So let's think about this. So what are the benefits of mowing your own lawn? Well, if you mow your own lawn, uh, your lawn is going to be mowed. So let's write this out. Let's put it out in a nice table. we got mow your lawn. Uh, so we got mow it yourself. And we have someone else, okay? And we got benefits, and we got costs. And let's fill this in. Well, in either case, your, your lawn's gonna be mowed. Your lawn will be mowed. Uh, but the costs are gonna be different, right? So in uh, one case, the uh, costs are gonna be that you have to give up money, so whatever else you would have bought with that money and in the doing it yourself option, well, you're going to have to give up time. Uh, so whatever else you would have done with that time. And let's think about this. Well, we could write, the, write it like this, like we just did. We could also write it a little bit differently. Well, uh, let's, let's not even consider this someone else column right here. Let's just talk about what are the costs and benefits of mowing it yourself. Well, if your alternative is to get somebody else to do it, we're going to be comparing between the two options. Right? Not just comparing things within the mow yourself option. Uh, so, well, what are the benefits of mowing your lawn? Well, you get your lawn mowed. Okay, great. But also, you don't lose the time that you would have lost if you got somebody else to do it. So the benefits are don't lose time. How about the costs? Well, uh, you lose some money, okay? But you don't get the lawn mowed by somebody else. Okay, so don't get lawn mowed. Now, we have lawn mode up here, we got lawn mode down here, so those are going to go ahead and cancel each other out. So what are the benefits of mowing something, mowing the lawn yourself? Well, you, you don't lose the time that you would have lost by getting somebody else to mow it. 
What are the costs of mowing the lawn yourself? Well, you've got to give up some money. So you're going to lose whatever you would have bought with that money and instead gain whatever you would have spent that time on. That's a pretty basic example. Uh, and so when we're thinking about whether, but, it, but it, it's going to give us a result. It's going to give us a conclusion. We can follow the cost benefit principle and choose the option for which the benefits most exceed the costs. Uh, and as long as we're carefully considering the alternative that we have, and considering that, well, the benefits here are the costs over here, and the costs here are the benefits over here, we're going to end up choosing the option that's the best for us. And, and here you can very clearly see, well, are you going to want to mow the lawn yourself? Well, which one do you care more about, the money or the time? Uh, and we've really boiled it down a little bit in terms of how we can make this decision. Now, that's a very basic example, but let's see if we can use this principle to explain something that's a little bit more complex. Uh, so we're going to try to explain the world a little bit, right? So this is what I'm saying. Economists are going to try to explain the world using incentives. So let's, let's start with an observation. We're going to start with a strange observation that you may have noticed. You may never thought about it before. So you may have noticed that if you are in a car, uh, a young child or a toddler, right, a baby, uh, is going to have to have their own car seat, okay? Required by law, and even if it wasn't, I think most people will probably do it anyway, okay? Uh, but you might have also noticed if you're in a plane, Kids can sit on their parents' laps. They don't need their own seat. They, they certainly don't need a car seat. So why is it this way? Why have we designed the policy uh, in such a way where we require the, the kid to be in their own car seat in a car, but we don't require that in a plane? Uh, this is seemingly an odd set of behaviors, but let's see if we can explain it uh, using incentives as a base. How can, how can we explain this using incentives? Uh, so let's consider the two options here, okay? Uh, and we're going to uh, do, oh, we're going to have a, uh, in a car over here on the left, and we're going to have in a plane over here on the right. We have two different situations. We have two different choices, right? In the car we chose have their own seat. In the plane we chose uh, to have, uh, be able to sit on the parent's lap. Uh, so let's try to explain these two different choices. So we're going to have in each case, we're going to choose have their own seat uh, or the uh, uh, lap option. And the same thing over here in the plane, own seat and lap. Now I've given us two options in each of these, but like we saw with the mow yourself uh, uh, choice to be made, we're only going to need one of these columns, right? Because anything that we could write in lap, we could just sort of flip it and put it under own seat. Right? If there's a good thing about being in the lap, well, we could just say that it's a cost of choosing your own seat, right? Uh, because if we could have it, that nice thing, if we put the kid in, in the lap, it's a cost of picking your own seat because you don't get to have that nice thing, right? It's a cost. So let's think about what, are, what some of the, of the costs and benefits are here. Okay, so uh, if you're in your own seat, okay. Uh, so first of all, there's a safety aspect to this, right? So safety uh, is going to be happening in both of these, right? So in both cases, the kid is safer in their own seat, right? If there's some sort of crash, they're going to be better off. Uh, being in their own seat. It's going to be safer. Uh, also, it might be easier uh, for behavior, right? If a kid is strapped into their car seat and can't get out, uh, one in the car, uh, they're not going to climb up into the front seat and try to, jam, you know, put a foot on the gas pedal. And if it's on a plane, they're not going to start running up and down the aisles. Okay, so we got benefits there in both cases. How about the cost? Well, in both cases in the cost, you have to free up a seat, right? If you have a, uh, a car seat in your car, uh, nobody else can sit there, right? Whereas if you put the kid in your lap, somebody else could take that seat. Similarly, in a plane, if you put a kid in their own seat, nobody else can sit there, you gotta buy an extra ticket. All right, so clearly, costs and benefits explain what's going on here, uh, except that we've written out the same sets of costs and benefits in both cases, and we got different results. So clearly, we're leaving something out. Well, let's think about this. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna go back to these benefits and costs, and let's think about safety for a second. So first of all, We've got safety issues in both cases, but in the car case, safety is going to be a lot bigger of an issue, simply because you're a lot more likely to get in a car accident than a plane accident. Get into a random car, you're a lot more likely to crash than if you were in a plane. So it's a lot more likely that that safety issue is going to be relevant at all, right? If you don't get in a crash, it doesn't matter that the car seat was keeping them safe in the crash, right? So we're comparing car. Uh, where safety is going to be a big issue, and we can compare that to plane where safety is a relatively small issue because you're very unlikely to crash in a plane. Okay, uh, how about the free a seat, the cost aspect of giving them their own seat? Uh, well, in the car, 
I mean, that's still a significant cost, right? You have to free up that seat for a kid, uh, but it's going to be a lot bigger in a plane, right? How much does it cost to get a plane ticket? More than $100, right? Probably $200, $300, depends where you're going. In a car, it's a lot cheaper to get your own seat, right? How much does it cost to rent an Uber? Uh, it's certainly a lot cheaper than it is to get a plane ticket for, you know, even a comparable amount of time. Uh, so in the car, the, the cost is going to be relatively small, and the, uh, in the plane, the cost is going to be relatively big. So when we compare these, right, we have similar lists of costs and benefits, but the, in, in the car case, the costs are a lot bigger, uh, or sorry, the costs are a lot smaller, and the benefits are a lot bigger. Whereas in the plane, the costs are a lot uh, bigger, and the benefits are a lot smaller. So it makes a lot of sense now to understand why we would choose put the kid in their own seat in the car, put the kid in, uh, your, in your lap on a plane. Right, so we had some weird behavior, we observed something in the world, we were able to explain it using incentives. And that's, that's what economics does, right? We saw this strange thing and now we understand the world a little bit better. And these are the kinds of decisions that people take into account when making policy, right? Whoever decided uh, that cars, you know, you had to have them in, in their own seat was weighing these costs and benefits. Whoever decided that you could sit in your, in the kid, in your parent's lap in the plane was thinking about these costs and benefits. Uh, and even though they weren't thinking about each other, it's not like the person in charge of the plane rule was thinking, okay, well, my, relative to cars, the benefit is, is, uh, big, is smaller, but the cost is bigger. They were just thinking, well, what are my costs and benefits, right? What are the costs and benefits in this plane scenario? But as observers, we can look at the costs and benefits and the incentives that they faced and explain their decisions, which is what economists like to do, right? We like to explain those decisions and understand the world through the lens of those decisions. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to move on a little bit. We're going to introduce two more uh, vocabulary terms today. The first one uh, is going to be economic surplus. This is another fairly basic common sense idea. Uh, it's the difference between benefits and costs. So economic surplus really is just benefit minus cost, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, and if you remember back, we had the, co we had the cost benefit rule. Uh, cost benefit principle. So clearly whichever option has the best benefit minus cost or the best economic surplus, that's the option that you want to go with. Uh, when you're trying to weigh how attractive any particular option is, you're going to want to consider how big is that economic surplus. Uh, well, so let's calculate out an economic surplus. So let's start with a very basic example. Let's talk about buying a jalapeno. Okay, buying a jalapeno, very simple choice. I'm going to the store and my decision is I either buy the jalapeno or I don't buy the jalapeno. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's think about jalapeno. We've got benefits and we got costs. Okay, what are the benefits of buying a jalapeno? You have a jalapeno. What are the costs of buying a jalapeno? Well, if you go to the store, they're pretty cheap. I'd say that probably most of the time you can get a jalapeno for about 20 cents. Okay, so. Uh, Let's fill this in a bit more right here, right? So we talked about economic surplus, benefit minus cost. Well, have a jalapeno isn't a number, so you can't really subtract anything from it. So let's put a number on it. So we're going to use my subjective valuation. So I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you how much I would value having a jalapeno, okay? And that's how we're going to get the benefits here, right? It's, it's a subjective valuation. You might value it differently. And so your, your economic surplus calculation would be different. Uh, this person over here might value it differently again, and their economic surplus calculation would be different, right? The benefit of having a jalapeno depends on how much you like jalapenos. In my case, I value having a jalapeno at about $3, okay? And that's the answer to the question, if I offered you a jalapeno or $3, which one you, would you choose? And I, would, I wouldn't be able to choose. I'd value them both equally, right? If I'd value that jalapeno the same as being handed $3. Okay, so I value the jalapeno at $3. It costs me 20 cents. So what's my economic surplus, right? Simple enough, economic surplus is $3 minus 20 cents, which is gonna be $2.80. Seems like a pretty good deal. Uh, now, if you hated jalapenos, if you only valued them at 10 cents, that would not be so good a deal for you. Remember, these benefit valuations are completely subjective. Uh, so we have this idea of economic surplus. We're going to try to get the biggest economic surplus we have, right? Follow that cost-benefit principle. Choose the option with the biggest economic surplus available. Uh, and that's basically how we're going to say we should make decisions, right? Pick the option that is the best option. Really complex stuff. 
Uh, we're getting there though. So we need to introduce one last term and that is opportunity cost. Now this is an important one. You might've heard of this one before. Uh, this is an important concept and it sort of brings together a number of the things that we've been talking about earlier in this video. Uh, so we talked first of all about how the benefit of one thing could be not having to pay a cost of doing something else, right? Or vice versa. The cost of one thing could be not having the benefit of doing something else. That whole concept that I was talking about right there, that's, uh, that's opportunity cost, right? That's the cost you pay by giving up the opportunity to do something else. So as a very basic example, imagine that you're going to spend a night out and you have a decision of either going to the movie or going to the theater. Uh, uh, and so what's the opportunity cost of going to the movie? Well, you don't get to go see the play that you would have seen in the theater. Okay. Uh, there's also a benefit, right? You don't have to pay the ticket price that you would have had to pay at the theater, right? So all the things that you would have gotten with your alternative, alternative option, you don't get anymore. Uh, and so that's what opportunity cost is all about. So we're going to expand this idea of economic surplus, right? It's still going to be benefits minus costs, but let's think about what benefits and costs really are, because it's not just the direct stuff, right? If we look at a jalapeno, there's some direct benefits and costs. And that's the stuff that you can sort of touch. You can touch the direct benefits and costs. What's the direct benefit of getting a jalapeno? You have a jalapeno. You can touch that jalapeno. You take that jalapeno home with you and you put it in some chili, okay? What's the direct cost of a jalapeno? 20 cents. You hand over the 20 cents. You no longer have that 20 cents. Your wallet is a little bit lighter. That is the direct cost of the jalapeno. But we also have the indirect costs and benefits, which is basically the same as saying the opportunity costs. So let's say that uh, we are going to have those direct and indirect costs. And an interesting thing about that idea of direct and indirect costs is that once you incorporate direct and indirect costs, only one option is going to turn out to have a positive economic surplus. That's going to be the option you're going to want to go with. Right? That's going to be the option that's going to maximize your economic surplus, obviously, because it's the only one that's positive. Let's see why this is. Let's go back to our jalapeno example, but this time let's say we have an alternate option. It's not jalapeno or nothing. This time it's jalapeno or a jug of milk. Okay? Those are our only options that's in this fantasy example. We have to pick exactly one of these things, and we are going not, go not going to be able to get both. We have exactly $2.50 in our wallet. Uh, a milk a jug of milk costs $2.50, so we just simply can't afford to have both of them. Okay, so uh, we're going to add to this table right here. We're going to add some milk. Now, this time the benefits, again, you get a gallon of milk. Uh, but what are we going to value that at? Well, I'm going to say that my subjective valuation of getting that gallon of milk is going to be $6. So first thing to note is that the benefits outweigh the costs, right? The direct benefits outweigh the direct costs in both of these cases, right? $3 is bigger than 20 cents and $6 is bigger than 250. So which one do we pick? Uh, well, we're going to have to think, incorporate not just the direct costs and benefits, but also the indirect costs and benefits, those opportunity costs. So let's calculate out our economic surplus. And it's going to be a little bit different this time. I'm going to cross this out. Okay, so let's say the economic surplus that economic surplus of a jalapeno. Well, what this is going to be, it's going to be our benefits minus our costs, okay? But there's two kinds of benefits. There's direct benefits and there's indirect benefits. So we're going to add those together, direct benefits plus indirect benefits, okay? And minus costs, but there's two kinds of costs. So we've got to subtract the direct costs and we have to subtract the indirect costs. Okay, now we got to fill these in. Now, what's our direct benefit? Our direct benefit we determined was $3. Okay, what's our indirect benefit? Well, remember, uh, these are going to be the things basically that we can't touch. We talked about the direct benefits and costs as being the things that you touch. You touch that jalapeno, you bring it home. You touch that money, you give it up. But we don't actually, the milk doesn't actually happen, right? If we're picking the jalapeno, the milk doesn't actually happen. We don't go home with a gallon of milk. We don't pay the 250. So the indirect costs and benefits are really the costs of what didn't happen, the stuff that you can't touch, okay? So what's the indirect benefit here? Well, what didn't happen? What costs didn't we incur? We did not have to pay $2.50 for a gallon of milk. So our indirect benefit is the cost that we did not have to pay of $2.50. 
How about the direct cost, right? So now we, got, we have the direct benefit plus the indirect benefit. We're going to subtract out our direct cost. That one's easy. That's 20 cents. How about the indirect cost? Well, that's the cost we pay by not having the benefit of the gallon of milk, right? It's the stuff that didn't happen. The indirect stuff is the stuff that didn't happen. So we would have enjoyed that milk to the tune of $6, but we don't get it anymore. So instead, we are going to subtract off that $6 as a $6 benefit that we did not get. We can calculate this all out. $3 plus $2.50 is $5.50. Uh, subtract $0.20 cents is $5.30. Uh, subtract $6 is going to be, it's going to give us negative $0.70. Cents. So that is the economic surplus of the jalapeno, right? We used to think it was $2.80, but now once we put it up against the milk, right, nothing actually changed about the jalapeno. All that changed was what our alternative was. Now our economic surplus for the jalapeno doesn't look so good anymore. Uh, and because it's negative, we can tell that we don't want to get that jalapeno. So let's, let's also calculate out the economic surplus of the milk as long as we're here. The same idea, direct benefit plus indirect benefit minus direct cost minus indirect cost. So what's our direct benefit? Well, it is $6. We enjoy that milk to the tune of $6. What's the indirect benefit? Well, we don't have to pay the 20 cents that we would have had to pay if we got a jalapeno. So we're going to add on the 20 cents that we no longer have to pay from the jalapeno. Subtract off the direct costs. Well, that's the 250 of our milk. And subtract off the indirect costs. Right? Well, it's our indirect cost. Well, we did not get to enjoy that jalapeno, and we would have enjoyed it to the amount of $3. So we lose out on the $3 of enjoyment we would have had, that's our indirect cost. Calculate that out, $6 plus 20 cents, $6 and 20 cents, uh, minus 250, and minus $3, we're gonna end up with exactly 70 cents. Now you'll notice that uh, these are exact mirrors of each other, right? One is positive 70 cents, the other is negative 70 cents. That's not a mistake, right? When we're comparing these two alternatives and we're calculating the economic surplus, we're basically saying the milk is better than the jalapeno by 70 cents. So whether it's milk minus jalapeno, you get 70 cents, or jalapeno minus milk, negative 70 cents, it works the same either way. Now you can also see here why we end up getting the result that only one option is going to be good. When you're correctly considering the alternative that you have, uh, well, you're really thinking about, in economic surplus terms, which one is better than the other. You can't have both of them be better than each other, so only one option is going to turn out to be the one that's worthwhile. And that's what we can do with the idea of economic surplus. So, just a little recap of what we went over today. So first of all, we talked about the scarcity principle. The scarcity principle says that there's always going to be a trade-off. There's always going to be choices to make. Cost-benefit principle tells us how we should make those choices by considering the costs and benefits and choosing the option for which the benefits most exceed the costs. Okay. Uh, then we talked about the incentive principle. The incentive principle doesn't talk about how you should make decisions. It talks about how people do make decisions. Uh, if you want people to make uh, more decisions in a certain way, you should improve the incentives uh, for that option, right? You improve the benefits, people are going to be more likely to do it. If you improve the, if you increase the costs, people are going to be less likely to do it. We talked about economic surplus, which is just benefits minus costs, which when we consider them properly, it's going to be the direct and indirect benefits and the direct and indirect costs. And those indirect costs and benefits, we can think of those as being opportunity cost. It's the costs that you pay by not choosing the alternative option that you had available to you. Uh, that's uh, what we have. And so what I want you to do, just a little bit of homework uh, to sort of make sure that you can understand this, I want you to map out a decision. Okay? I want you to choose a decision uh, that you are going to make or that you maybe have already made. I want you to think about the alternatives. I want you to just pick two of the alternatives because it gets a little bit more complex when you pick more than two. Just two alternatives, okay? Uh, and uh, so I want you to then list out the benefits and costs of each of those alternatives. Uh, and then I want you to put a number value on all those benefits and costs. So if it was a case like the jalapeno and the milk, right, you could put a dollar value. And this decision could be anything. It could be do I go to college or not? Right? How much do I value that college experience and how much extra money am I going to make because I have a degree uh, versus the cost of spending all the time that you have at college? Put a number value on that. Right? Just, and you can just make up these number values. Right? It's just how much you would value them. Right? There's no right answer for those. Once you have all those numbers written down, you can calculate out the economic surplus of each of your options. Uh, and from that, it should tell you which is the better option to take. You might notice this whole approach is really similar to just writing out a pros and cons list and then putting numbers on it, because that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, again, 
All the stuff that we've done today is pretty common sense. Uh, what's interesting about it is how far you can really take it and how much stuff you can explain using these relatively common sense principles. We're going to take this idea of explaining stuff with incentives, explaining stuff with costs and benefits, and we're going to be able to work it up to very big questions. Not just should you get a milk or a jalapeno, but things like how do markets work? Right? How do all these individual decisions come together to make a big market? How does government policy work and how should it be designed? Uh, why do people make choices, right? There's whole, there's economics explaining all different kinds of choices, even stuff that we don't think should be governed by incentives. Stuff like how many kids are you going to have? Who are you going to marry? Uh, what kind of job are you going to get? All that stuff can be explained at least in part by incentives. And that's what we're going to be doing this turn. Thank you.